Chris has used up all my time, so we're going to have to really go fast. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we're going to be tonight. Um, I want to say something to you uh, about what's going on in our country before we get started into our Bible study. I haven't watched the news. I don't watch the news. I don't have that capability, really, other than listen to it on the radio or social media. And, and But I got a text from uh, one of our church members earlier, and, and they just said, Brother Tracy, I just want you to send me some Send me some scripture that will uh, give me peace and give me comfort for what's going on right now. I'm, I'm fearful. And uh, I did that and uh, sent her some encouraging scriptures about our sovereign God. But I have been trying uh, through the direction of the Lord for the last while, a little while, to prepare us for what lies ahead. Guys, I just want to reiterate, these things must happen. You are watching a country come unraveled because they have said no to God. Anytime a nation, righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach on any people. And you're just simply seeing our country, and I know it breaks your heart and it breaks my heart. And it should, but fear is not an option. You hear you, preacher? Fear is not an option for you if you're a child of the king. It's only begun. These things must happen. Amen, sister. Birth pains. That's what's going on. And what should we do? Cling to the king. <laughs> Just cling to the king. And as it gets gloriously darker and darker, cast your eyes eastward and look for our, re our rejoicing and our hope because it draws close. I'm not a chicken little. The sky's fallen. I never have been, but I know what God's word says. I refuse to live in fear. We're in the middle of a pandemic that's very real. Nobody can say it's not. Our country's coming unraveled. But God's kids are to be on the edge of their seats with enthusiasm. Amen or not? All right, you're in chapter 11. I'm in chapter 11, and that's where we're supposed to be. As we begin this uh, 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians tonight, Paul is still addressing questions that was written to him in a letter from this church in Corinth. Uh, remember chapter 1, verse 1, where we picked that thought up? Paul said, now for the matters you wrote me about. And then he began to answer uh, those matters in chapter 7. First thing he talked about was marriage. Then he started talking about foods that were sacrificed to idol. That led over into the, the, the long discussion and teaching about Christian freedom. And so Paul continues to respond to the Corinthians' questions uh, and in chapter 11, he addresses the issue with women not honoring the Lord with the position that God ordained them. Now, we're going to get into some uh, 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 subject. We're going to get into this subject tonight. Then I'll just tell you uh, the teachings of the Apostle Paul that we're going to get into tonight is absolutely flat footed, rejected in the 21st century. Absolutely flat-footed, rejected by our society. But can I just tell you, that doesn't change the truth of God's Word. God has spoken. We're not going to misinterpret it. We're going to read exactly what Paul says. Uh, and really, you can't miss it. So, having said all that, we're going to start. Usually, we'd start in verse 1, but we included verse 1 of chapter 11 at the end of chapter 10 because I believe it goes with it. So we're going to start in verse 2, and uh, we're just going to read uh, one verse. How about that? We'll do, we'll do two. How about that? Verse 2, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings just as I passed them on to you. Verse 3, and this is where we're going to spend all our time tonight. Now, I want you to realize, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, 
and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Pray with me before we get started. Lord, uh, we're your students tonight. Uh, we're in your classroom, and you are the teacher. Holy Spirit, uh, we just pray, God, that you would uh, teach us through your word. Help us, O oh Lord, not to be distracted. Father, help us to not uh, take our thoughts, our wants, our ambitions, and try to apply it to your word. But Lord, just, just help us to take the raw meat of your word tonight uh, and let it be an encouragement, let it be a challenge, uh, let it be the nourishment that we'll grow by, that we might be more like you, that we might honor you and your kingdom. Father, meet with us and teach us in Jesus' name. And all of God's hands said, amen. So, Paul uh, is continuing his response to the letter that he got, and the question obviously has come to them or to him about positions of women, uh, not only in the church but in society. Uh, now, why would this question be presented to him? Because obviously everything was out of whack. The, they wouldn't ask the question if it wasn't. Now, this is really verse two. If you if you have been with us since we started. This is really the first time that Paul has commended the Corinthian believers for anything. How many of y'all been with us since we started Corinthians? This is really the first time that Paul commends them, pats on the back, for anything except for the fact that he acknowledged that they are true brothers and sisters in Christ. They are Christians, but this is the first time he has commended them for anything other than being Christians. So here's the truth. The basic problem with the Corinthians, and I want you to listen to me. The basic problem with the Corinthians is really the same basic problems that most Baptist congregations have today. And I, and I stuck with Baptists because uh, that's, that's what we run with. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a doctrinal issue. That's not their problem. But it's an application issue. Are y'all all right? It's not a theology problem. It's a moral problem. It's a lifestyle problem. In other words, it's not that they don't know the truth of God's Word. They know it. They know who God is. Uh, they know all about God. They know His works. Uh, but they don't live godly lives. It's an application problem, which is not good. That's bad. Now, but here, before Paul begins to correct them, uh, he commends them. He compliments them on uh, their strengths. And one of their strengths is that doctrinally, they hold true. Isn't that what verse 2 says? He, he says, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Some translation says trans, uh, tra traditions there. I praise you for holding the traditions passed down. Those traditions are referring to the teachings of the apostles that were just passed down. So he's praising them for that. Praise the Lord. You got that right. Verse 3. But now, and he states the issue in verse 3. I want you to realize, I want you to understand. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Hey, listen, church. I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. I want you to realize this. And then he goes in to the issue at hand. Why would he say that? Why would he say, I want you to realize this? I want you to understand this. Well, obviously, they were proving... <laughs> By the way they were acting, their actions proved that they didn't get it. Or if they did get it, they were unwilling to apply it. They didn't understand the positions given to men and the positions given to women that were ordained by God. This is the issue that they have written to Paul about, and he's beginning to correct them on it. Are y'all all right? start talking about women and men in the church, boy, everybody gives you that Clint Eastwood look. Well, here's the news flash. I'm fixing to set you free. Brother Tracy did not write the Bible. I just, I'm just teaching out of it. If you get your feathers in a wad tonight, 
take it up with God. Is that fair? Amen. Thank both of you. So the first step for correcting this problem was for Paul to enlighten them on what God has done, on God's actions, on God's order. By the way, how many of you really get that God is sovereign and he don't have to ask anybody anything? Man, he don't ask nobody nothing. He don't ask for permission. He doesn't ask for opinions. God sovereignly in his wisdom makes decisions that are perfect and just every time. That's how he's created us, not perfect. Well, he did create us perfect and then sin come into the world, but that's another uh, sermon. So he's enlightening in them. That's the first step. The principle of subordination or the principle of subordination and authority, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight, it's, it's summarized by one word, position. Men have positions in society ordained by God, and women have positions in society ordained by God. I told you this flies in the face, flat in the face of 21st century society that we lived in, that we live in. And again, if you have a problem with it, you got a problem with God. So first thing he says, uh, God in his wisdom, he doesn't say this, but we know this, God in his wisdom, this position that we're referring to, God in his wisdom has sovereignly chosen the order by which he operates and which his creation operates. Now, notice I said he operates. Paul's going to tie some things together that can't be untied in giving us the examples to show us what these positions or this order is tonight. Amen? So, uh, the head of every man, he starts off. Now, I want you to realize that the head of every man, that's a reference to humanity. That's not a reference to the male. That's a reference to humanity. Every man uh, is Christ. What, is, what does he mean by head? Well, head is a reference to headship, which means leader or chief. It's a position sovereignly appointed by God. The head of every man is Christ. Jesus Christ is the uniquely uh, cre uh, start to say created. Jesus Christ is uniquely the head of the church, which is made up of men and women. Amen or not? The church is made up of men and women. He has redeemed us and he has bought us with his own blood. In his divine authority, Christ is the head of every human being, believer and unbelievers, amen or not. He's the head of all humanity, whether they believe in him or not. He still is the head. Let me give you some scriptures to back that up. First of all, Matthew 28, Josh is going to be like a machine gun, putting them on the screen. There he goes, first bullet. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's the head of every man, believer or unbeliever. He has total authority in heaven and on earth. You know what that scripture says? Total authority in heaven and on earth. Hebrews 2 and 8. All things are subject to him and put everything under their feet. That is a reference to being in subje of subjection under their feet and putting everything under them. God left nothing that is not subject to them, yet at the present we do not see everything subject to them. He's talking about being in subjection. Philippians 2, 10 through 11. That at the name of who? Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is he talking about? He is preeminent over creation. He is head of every man. Christ is. Uh, there's just no getting around that. He is the head 
Now, that's the first length in this chain that he's making, this threefold chain. Second part of that verse says what? And here's where the rub comes in. Here's where everybody gets itchy and uh, frustrated, and uh, here's where it just, uh, uh, it all flies in the fan right here. And the head of the woman is man. Now, remember, what does head mean? It refers to headship, which means leader, leadership. So, the head of every woman is man. Now, there's lots and lots of debate about the Scripture, what the reference in these verses are. Uh, the Greek word here is aner for man, and the Greek word for woman is gune. These words can be used for man or husband or woman or wife. So there's a lot of debate. Uh, matter of fact, the English Standard Version uses the word husband and wife. The NIV uses the word man and woman. And there's a debate about, is this talking about in the marriage setting? Well, because those Greek words are interchangeable or you can mean uh, man and woman or husband and wife, when you have that instance, you have to let the context define how the word will be used. And as you look through this passage, you see nothing about marriage. Context is not about a marriage. Context is about a man and a woman individually. So I think the ESV got it wrong and the NIV got it right this time. The head of every, or, and the head of the woman is man. Uh, is this strictly talking about in the church? Well, of course not. It's not just talking about in the church. That's another big part of the debate over this uh, verse. To understand this rightly is to understand that Paul's reference is to men and women, single or married. It doesn't matter. The other debate that I just mentioned refers to the instances of just the church. This is just a reference to in the church. But the fact that Paul gives three examples of headship sets up the context of talking about not just the church, but the society too. God is a God of order, and he has created us to function inside his order, not the order that we set up. Now, we just talked about our country and it coming unraveling. This is all part of it. Why is America the way it is? Why are we coming unraveled? We have taken all that God has created. We've rewritten how we should function. We are out of God's order when it comes to the male and female relationship. We, just, we have been for years. We just have been for years. What, does, what happens when the creation gets out of the creator's order? The same thing always happens. Dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction. And that's what we see in our society. By the way, that's what's going on in this Corinthian church. Next Wednesday, we'll get deeper into it. But that's what's going on. That's what was written to Paul. Tell us what we should do because the women here are out of order. They're, for, they're in playing roles that you didn't uh, create them to play. That's out of order. So this applies to believers and non-believers. This is not just for Christians. This is a societal thing. God created all things, right? Now, I touched on this, but I want to touch on some more. We realize as we study this that this truth from God's Word is absolutely, totally unacceptable. Let me hear from you. Am I right or wrong? In the 21st century, for anyone to declare that men are to lead, they were designed to lead in society, and that women were to, 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 out of love, submit to their leadership. That is totally not accepted. Matter of fact, in lots of places, and I'll just go as far as say this, in lots of denominations, I'd be getting stronger looks than I'm getting from y'all. Possibly some vegetables would have done arrived here. 
But guys, can I just tell you, it still doesn't change the truth of God's word. This is what God has said. If we would stick with the book, our country wouldn't come unraveled like it's doing right now. I mean, that's just the truth. I'm, I'm not trying to read into this. I'm not trying to build this up more than what God has said. He clearly says the headship of the woman is the man. So here we are in this secular society in the 21st century, and the world just doesn't accept it. The world rejects it and has been, and the sad part is many denominations today uh, they pervert this teaching, they avoid this teaching, uh, they misinterpret this teaching, they purposely overlook this teaching. By the way, that's the good thing about exegetical preaching. You know what exegetical preaching is, right? You start in the front and you preach to the back, and you preach and teach everything in between. You don't pick and choose. That's exegetical preaching, and that's the good thing about it. You get everything that God has said in between. Now, the bigger truth, and we've touched on this too, but we need to also realize that one of the major reasons our society is upside down and dysfunctional is because men and women have been, now listen to how I say this because I'm intentionally saying this like it is. Men and women have been unwilling to honor God's sovereign decision in the positions we've been given. You didn't get to choose whether you were a man or a woman in your mother's womb. God did. He chose me as a man. He chose you as a woman. I am no more valuable to his kingdom than a female is. Not a bit. I just have a different position. And that's the truth. Let me clarify it a little bit more. God makes no distinction. Nowhere in Scripture do we see God make a distinction between men and women as far as their worth, their ability, their intellect, or their spirituality. Did you hear what I said? God makes no distinction anywhere in his, nowhere in God's word does God say that a man is more valuable than a woman, because we're not. That a man is more intelligent than a woman, because we're not. That we're more spiritual because we're not. He doesn't declare that anywhere. He doesn't make that distinction. Matter of fact, women are completely equal to men, spiritually speaking. How about that? Completely equal. I'll go a step further. Women are many times, I can't hardly get this out, superior to men. All you women say amen. <laughs> women are many times more superior to men in their abilities, their intellects, their maturity, their spirituality. Why is that? Because it's not about our gender when it comes to our worth and our value and what we're capable of. It's about our gender when it comes to positions that God has ordained. Are y'all all right? That's what we see in Scripture. God has established the positions and principle of male authority for his purpose of order in his creation. Churches may have women who are better Bible students. Absolutely. Absolutely. Better theologians, better speakers than any of the men, including the pastor. But if these women, with all of these great qualities, are obedient to God's order, they will submit to the male leadership and will not try to usurp their authority over the male. Why? Why? Because that's what God has ordained. Brother Tracy, you sound like a male chauvinist. Not at all. I didn't choose to be a male. I didn't choose my position. God ordained it when he spoke the world into creation. 
When he spit in the dirt, God ordained it. We have for centuries tried to unordain what God has ordained. The chickens are coming home to roost. Go home, turn the news on, you'll see it. By droves, the chickens are coming home to roost. If we'd have stuck with the plan. I got me a fancy radio from a truck. I mean fancy. Y'all seen my old truck out there, ain't you? Next time you walk by, look over in there at that radio. You ain't ready for this, but I'm finna give it to you. I got me a backup camera. So I make my, <laughs> is Lois here? Lois ain't here. Lois said, what's she going to do today? So I'm put my radio in. Thought she's going to get Grant to do that. I don't need Grant to put no radio in for me. I know what I'm doing. So after about a half a day, my radio's hanging out of my dash, and there's wires everywhere, and ain't nothing working. I called my son-in-law to get him to come out there, and he didn't come. I just doubled down. I'll get this done. I got the radio working. I couldn't get the camera working. So I got my old buddy Chris, who's pretty sharp on that stuff. You know what the first thing Chris asked me for? You ain't going to believe this. Instructions. I said, what? Don't need no instructions, man. And he said, I can tell you don't. I don't know where I'm going with this. Huh? <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> but I found the instructions. Glory to God. Chris and Michael Partain got my camera working. Grant got a little in on it over the phone. We got the phone working. The radio's working now. I'm boogalooing down the highway, man. Everything's good. And I don't know why I started telling you that story, but you've heard the whole story. Huh? <laughs> you got it, Walter. Walter's been my right hand for, for 20 years. He just pulled me out again. Stick to the plan. If I'd have got them instructions out, I still couldn't have done it, but I probably would have done better. Amen or not? Stick to the plan. Thank you, Walter. I got so engrossed in that story, man. I was reliving it in front of all of y'all. What book are we in? <laughs> 1 Corinthians, right. Stick to the plan. That'll do it. Yeah. Well, shouldn't the man... Shouldn't the man uh, who's been given the position of head be just as vigilant about his position? Absolutely. But let me tell you why we're even talking about this. Because a letter was written to Paul asking about the mat matter of these women in the Corinthian church getting out of their lane. That's the only reason we're talking about it. So that's the reason Paul brings this up, because the church at Corinth is having issues with the women being rebellious outside of their God-given position. Let's look at two more links, and we're going to go. The third example Paul gives uh, is the head, uh, one more link. The third example he gives is the head of Christ is God. So everybody has somebody over them, right? Above them. Now, in Scripture, listen to me, because Paul is linking these together because they're inseparable. Headship, okay? In Scripture, Jesus made it absolutely clear that he submitted himself to his Father's will. Are y'all all right? Jesus submitted himself totally to his Father's will. He showed submission from his Father. John 4, 34. Machine Gun Kelly on the screen. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of who? Him who sent me and to finish his work. What was Jesus' life all about while he was here on planet Earth? There's an old gospel song. You've heard it that they sing and it makes you cry? 
while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. No, you weren't. While he was on the cross, pleasing the Father was on his mind. Why? Because Jesus was totally submitted and obedient, thank you, Wayne, to the will of his Father. Jesus' 33 years on earth was all about the will of his Father. Why? Because he submitted to his Father. John 5, 30. He didn't seek to please himself. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. My judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. He's all about the will of the Father. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus Christ is totally under the headship of God the Father. But watch this. Jesus Christ has never been before, during, or after his incarnation in any way inferior, in essence, to the Father. But he was in total submission. Why does Paul link these together? Because Paul wants to, uh, us to understand. Isn't that what he started off by saying? I want you to realize, I want you to understand that we all are under the headship of someone. All of mankind is under the headship of Christ. The woman is under the headship of the man. And Jesus Christ is under the headship of God the Father. Yet none of them is inferior to the others. Christ is not inferior to God the Father, but he's under the headship of God the Father and submission to the Father. The woman is no way, in, in any way, inferior to a man, but in God's order, the headship goes to the man. That's God's created position. Let me finish. Verse 3, Paul ties all of these principles together. They are inseparable. You cannot reject one point and keep another principle. You can't say, well, I can see where all of man is under the headship of Christ, and I can see where Christ is under the headship of God, but I reject that woman would be under the headship of man. Then you got to reject the others too. You can't pick and choose. You got to reject them all. You can't just be wrong on one point. You got to be wrong on all three points. Or you can do what? You can accept the truth of God's word and receive the blessing. All three of these principles of submission are carried out in love. Now listen to me because this is super important. All three of these principles of submission are carried out in love, not under compulsion. Man doesn't, listen to me, man don't demand his position he receives his position. It's given to him by those who love God. Christ submits in love to the Father. Christians submit in love to Christ. Women submit in love to men. And all of this love goes to who? God. It's simple obedience. Submission in any other way besides of love is out of the plan the purpose, and the position that God has set forth. The world's a mess, guys. And this is one reason. Dysfunction entered the world a long time ago when everybody got out of their lane doing their own thing, trying to make it work. It won't work. We're created a distinct way to operate in a distinct order. I cannot do the things that God has created a woman to do. It won't work right. And vice versa. That's God's order. It's rejected by society. Matter of fact, and I'm not, being, I'm not trying to be uh, funny in any way. In many places, and I'm on camera and this is going on Facebook. In many places, what I just taught straight out of God's word is considered hate speech. Because the world rejects God's truth. And that will be considered hate speech. When really, 
It's love. It's love speech. Knowing that God's plans are perfect. If we'll just all stay in our lane, the blessings will come. And it's all done out of love and obedience to a sovereign God. Amen or not?